Fred uh, grew up in Kingsville, and then uh, he did a bachelor's degree in the SSN, and then after that he came over to my current environmental plant sciences and did a kind of cross between ecosystem science project and <coughs> some cross science with a guy named Rob. Washington Hill? Washington Hill. Uh, Duncan. Robert Duncan. And both of those guys left. <laughs> they abandoned him, and uh, anyway. Uh, not doing it anymore. Uh, anyway, and then since then we finished that up and he started this PhD project. You guys, some of you guys might recognize this. This started out in Sean Thompson project, and uh, he started in the heart state. We're trying to phenotype these, and we made a little progress. But then we got out to phenotype something a little bit easier, like the Sala. And, and in the end of the day, that led to two different projects, uh, NSF and the DOA project. So he's going to talk about our progress on trying to develop the use of DPR for these things. Right. Thank you, Dr. Ray. So, as Dr. Ray said, I'll be covering basically the labs, Dr. Ray's lab, uh, progress on utilizing ground penetrating radar for root menstruation or, or root phenotyping is what, what our objective really is. So, uh, again, we're, I mean, working in Dr. A's lab, but we also have uh, quite a bit of help from the Geosat Center from AM Geosciences. Uh, we'll see some of that in the sense of the software that we're developing to actually process the data. There's no real software system that can uh, function the way we need it to function in order to analyze a lot of this information that we're gathering. So we're working with the Geosat Center to develop some of that. And then we basically need a new technology, current technology, which I'll go through, it isn't necessarily there just yet. Uh, it, there's something available. It, it's semi-functional. We've actually proven that it works. Uh, you could use it, but it's, it's not ideal. So by uh, collaborating with IDS Geo Radar, they're working on developing new antenna array systems for us uh, to actually run through the field much faster and much more efficiently. So what are some of the objectives of, of the work that we're doing is to optimize GPR instruments. Uh, Specifically in the sense of frequency, frequency being is there a particular frequency that is optimal for different soil types, different root types. Uh, then there's a data processing for 3D root measuring. So again, going back to what I was saying in, in the sense of uh, software, we don't necessarily have a software system that can, that can do this three-dimensional renderization of the data that we're collecting. So can we develop a software that can actually do that? And then... Um, I'll leave out this soil organic carbon part. Uh, this is more in the sense of how we'll go about uh, measuring the soil organic carbon more indirectly. It, it's not a direct measurement of the GPR. It's going to be more of an indirect measurement of it. But at least that's my standpoint on it. Um, we'll we'll see about that. We're we're going to start working on some of that some of that data soon. So um, so use optimized GPR and, and design field card for uh, the whole plant dynamic, right? So um, I won't get too much into this. Uh, basically, I'll show more of the optimization of the new GPR system, right? Um, so the Fino card, the conceptualization is that we would have the capacity to both phenotype below ground uh, um, structure, but as well the above ground structure, because we want to know some of the sink, uh, first thing relationships, especially looking at roots and tubers. What is actually feeding that 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 sink in, in the sense of the roots? So. Um, and like I said, we'll leave, we'll leave this part out. So what's in, important to note is that currently it's time to phenotype uh, an image root if you're trying to do a screening of roots uh, or, or of uh, different gold bars is uh, germplasm is there's no way we can actually screen 80,000, 100,000 lines fast enough. Uh, we, we need to make progress, and we currently don't have that ability. So uh, the idea behind what we're doing is, is, is that how do we how do we get to information faster? How do we make uh, information more rapid and available to use for this selection process? So, um, basically an outline uh, went over that. So, ongoing research, optimization, and the data processing with some uh, preliminary or, or work that, that probably a lot of you have already seen in the sense of the cassava work that, that I've done. Um, we recently got this published in Plant Methods, and uh, so we, we've basically shown that the current technology is valid. We can utilize it. It's just 
it's not fast enough. We need to we need to move faster. So one thing that you'll know for or may not know for GPR, but uh, it, it's a big push um, pushback in, in GPR is that GPR doesn't work in all types of soil. It's not it, it it's not optimal for every region in Texas. But we want to see what are what are its capacities. What what can it do? What can't it do? So uh, in these initial studies, we've established some study sites across uh, soil distributions in Texas. And now we can go back and say, okay, what is our what is our current tool capacity? Uh, could the off the market off the off the shelf tools from the current market uh, be utilized in in these regions? Yes, no. We can answer some of those questions so that we can move forward faster in those regions. Or you know, let's take a step back that that's not working, and maybe we need new tools to come in and and work in some of these soil types. So this is a uh, some uh, perennial grasses that we're currently working with. Uh, this is with the help of Dr. Jessup as well. So um, this is kind of a, some of the crops that, that we're, we're looking to measure root, um, root biomass with. Um, so in current applications, these are the off-the-shelf tools, right? So this is what's out there, what's available, what we can start to use in the field. And so what you'll see here is, is uh, IDS. This is uh, the company that we're working for. They have this multi-array system called the Hybrite. And so it works at a 2 gigahertz frequency. 2 gigahertz uh, basically allows you to see roughly the first 30 centimeters of soil uh, down into the first 30 centimeters of soil. What we've actually found is that if the soil structure is, is a little more loose, if you will, um, you, you have this capacity to see uh, much deeper, right? So that's something that, that when, when you look at it theoretically, it shouldn't have the capacity to do that, but when you actually take it to the field for application, it has more more capacity than what what is uh, you know thought to be be possible. So it's beneficial to take these off the shelf you know tools and, and test it. What what is possible? And so what we did was we did test this in those soil types. Uh, the benefit with this tool is it's a it's a multi array, meaning that it's not only a single antenna scanning the the field. In in other words, I don't have to pass over a plant 15 times to get the total area of the plant. I can pass over the plant one time, and I have enough antennas to cover the distribution of the root zone so that I can get all that information in one pass, right? So um, that's the benefit of having a multi-array antenna. Dual polarization is basically saying that I have the capacity to look in two directions when I'm moving through the field. So not only am I capturing data uh, looking in this direction what's in front of me, so if a root crosses perpendicular to me, I can see that, but I also have the capacity by looking or changing my orientation of my antenna and the polarity of the antenna and now looking for roots running parallel to my direction of actual scanning. So we enhance the capability, right? We have the ability to do this utilizing these off-the-shelf tools. And so uh, we also utilize uh, U.S. Radar's quantum imager. The benefit of this tool in comparison to this one, this one has a 2 gigahertz central frequency. This tool actually steps through frequencies. So we're not limited to a single central frequency. It's not to say that this data will only give us 2 gigahertz information. In order to make that 2 gigahertz, it actually utilizes low frequencies and high frequencies to create a central. Uh, so there really is that data, but mathematically it's more intensive to actually process that information. Whereas this quantum imager, it steps through the frequency. It gives us the individual frequency response. We don't have to do that mathematical computation for it. For it, to break out the individual information. So it, it provides us uh, much more specific data in the sense of frequencies and seeing how those frequencies actually work in these soil types, right? So currently it only steps through three central frequencies, but uh, it has the capacity to be those frequencies to be changed. Uh, so that's that's the benefit. And then its bandwidth is greater than four gigahertz. So like it, it utilizes low frequencies and high frequencies to create a central frequency. So if you have a bandwidth of 4 gigahertz, if you really wanted to uh, break out the data, we have up to 4 gigahertz of information within a single scan uh, of data that we can, we can utilize. So not only are we capturing data with the GPR, there's, there's other data that needs to be captured in order to correct for uh, noise in the field, right? So a field isn't, uh, when, when you go into the field, the roots may be all the same from the same uh, variety, but the problem is the soils are different, right? There's distribution of soil in, uh, in the field that needs to be accounted for. You don't want to be measuring the distribution of soil. You want to be measuring the distribution of roots, right? So 
we uh, collected some EM data also to, to show some of those, those moisture distributions in the sense of uh, the soils there, and then also the GPS location so that we can go and overlay that information with our, our GPR scanner. And so basically it's a, it's a normalizing factor. Uh, we use it in the, the data processing to say that um, what is actually occurring is root and it's not something that is occurring locally, right? So. Um, there's more data that's, that's being captured, not just GTR data. So, what should be noted is that uh, here, physical phenotyping is uh, probably one of the inaccurate factors, right? So, I say that a little hesitantly because we, we don't know for certain what GTR does. Just yet, we're, I mean, that's what we're working for. But if you think about it, what we're trying to do is associate soil cores or root cores, if you will. So in each one of these, these are 15 centimeter uh, cores in depth by two centimeters in diameter. So what we're, at, what we're trying to do here is say that the total root mass that's in this one core is associated to a specific line scan at that position, right, for the, for the GPR as well. So what's to say that, that, you know, this is the accurate measure of what the root zone is at, you know, in these areas? So if, if my plant were to sit here in the middle, um, what's to say that most of my root mass was, or what's to say my root mass was actually distributed evenly across these three positions? It could have been drawn towards more directional. Uh, maybe there was more water in this direction, more nutrient in this direction. So root, root zones are moving this way. So when I core these other two, I got less root mass. And so it, it's kind of biased, right? We, we, don't, we don't know for certain because that's, I mean, that's what we're trying to test. But... Um, our, our biggest issue right now is, is going to be how do we go about actually uh, relating these, these phenotypes to what we're actually collecting. So one of the things that we've done is we've, uh, along with the, the Ag Engineering Department, is designed a new uh, coring tool. So basically it's a uh, 24 inches by 24 inches uh, deep by 6 inches, uh, 24 inches deep down into the ground and then 6 inches deep, I guess, in in the sense of a, a width. So um, it collects a larger profile so that we can actually start to say something uh, uh, relate back into the, with the GPR that it has a little more accuracy than, than just a two centimeter soil floor, right? So um, these are some of the complexities that, that we've had to overcome uh, as we go through because it's, it's not a, a very, you know, easy practice. It's, it, it, it's a, it's something that needs to be taken into consideration, and we've, we've moved away from this, these, soil, these uh, cylindrical soil cores and are starting to transition into um, these larger volume soil cores. It's more destructive, but the data is more specific or, or more related to uh, the data that we're actually capturing with the GTR. So for GTR optimization, we basically, like I said, need to get faster. How do we get faster? You get faster by adding more antennas, right? Because the more antennas, the more space I can cover. Uh, in the sense of uh, above ground phenotype, when we can add sensors like uh, uh, a Leica station, uh, a, a LIDAR station, uh, which we'll come to see that this is actually not only important to phenotyping the vegetation, but also important to the way the scanner works, right? So we'll, we'll cover some of that information in just a second. <laughs> so, in the sense of optimization, excuse me, I'm getting over a cold, so I'm not talking as well. <clears throat> but, uh, so, some of the adaptations that we need to make and, and consider are these radiation patterns, so for optimization of, of the current antennas. Currently, off the shelf antennas have these bow tie antenna structures, so it, it's really it's just a triangle, uh, kind of like this, uh, with another triangle on this side. And what it does is it creates this, this radiation pattern into the ground. What happens when you create this radiation pattern is a lot of the energy that you're actually emitting into the ground to do the data collection with is dissipated radially, right? I don't get my energy down into the ground where I need it. I, I start to lose it outward, right? So when that starts to happen, I no longer have the penetration capability. So I can't, I can't get deep enough to see where the roots are, uh, where they're moving at depth. Right, so this radiation pattern is currently what's available, and um, it's it's not beneficial to what we're trying to do. It's it's great for certain things. Uh, it, it's great for concrete. Um, it's great for for real sandy soil. You can you can utilize this. Uh, this is I mean, and this is what we've been using today. But 
you can see the, the intensity of the radiation is much less because it's, it's radially moving, right? Whereas you get something like a Vivaldi antenna or a Horn antenna where you start to focus this energy, you, you then start to really position the direction of that radiation, right? So you're, you're, you're directing the radiation to a specific position to where a lot of that energy is, is focused. Having that capability uh, or that uh, ability to focus the radiation, you then can, can get higher intensity radiation at your, at your focus point, giving us the capacity to go deeper, right? To visualize things much, uh, much lower. So this is some of the optimization that's been going on with uh, our partner at, at IBS Geo Radar. They've designed some new antennas, basically um, taken some military grade designs and uh, made kind of like declassified versions, if you will, of their, of their radiation patterns. They give us the capacity to measure, uh, measure routes, right? So what they're looking for in the military sector are these fine wires, these fine thin plastics. Um, so they have the capacity, they have that radiation directionality to actually measure that. Why can't we utilize that to measure routes? That's kind of the concept here and why we've been working with them. And they've been able to provide us with a radiation pattern that I, I can't show you uh, for obvious reasons. One, it's, it's the, still semi-classified kind of thing, but um, they've, they've developed some great, great incentives for us. The data is probably some of the best data that I've seen in, you know, the seven years now that I've been working with, with Trump and Radar. So. <laughs> this is uh, IDS Radar, basically their office. They, uh, <laughs> they are in the strip mall uh, kind of thing, and so they have these, basically a, a ceiling just like this, and what they ended up doing for us to start testing these new radiation patterns and, and new antenna designs was build this giant CNC machine um, inside their office. So they basically had to take out their, their entire ceiling uh, to, get, to get this in there. Um, but having this capability, right, to, to go in with a CNC arm and basically measure at specific distances, at specific resolution, right, uh, you, you get rid of the, the error that's possible by, by human hand in the sense of scanning how fast I'm moving, uh, what's the direction that I'm moving. So all of that's taken out of play, and now you're only left with what direction is the radiation moving, right? What, what is the radiation doing? So some preliminary tests that they did in the trough were to plant some roots and tuber kind of uh, crops, uh, some pork crops, um, Lego pieces. <laughs> Um, just to see what, what the capabilities are. And so these antennas that, they're current, that, that you'll see in here are uh, off-the-shelf antennas. For instance, this one here uh, mm. is, is just an off-the-shelf. I think it's a 900 megahertz antenna. But anyway, um, they basically, they, this was, these were buried. <laughs> so I don't think that we, you know, played it that easy. But they were buried into the sand um, at, at different depths. Um, and so they... We're able to pass these antennas over and start to get, uh, uh, see what, what, what actually returned there. Uh, recently we went and we actually planted some perennial sorghum into the troughs and then utilized the new antenna system. Uh, this is just the, the housing, so this isn't really what it looks like. Interior uh, antenna is, is much different. So, um, But anyway, the difference here is that you can see this is an air-launched antenna and this is a ground-coupled antenna. So with the bow tie, since your, your uh, radiation pattern is radial, right, you can't necessarily put it in the air. The second you put it in the air, you're dissipating your energy so fast because you're moving energy through air, so that's the speed of light, right? So I'm dissipating so much energy radially in the air. So I have to keep the antenna close to the ground or as close to the ground as possible. Whereas these new antennas, you have the capacity to move the antenna up into the air, uh, roughly right now somewhere around 50... 52 centimeters, I think, is, is where we're at in height. Um, so we now have the capacity to move over the vegetation instead of, you know, through the vegetation. Uh, obviously still not optimal for uh, these perennial grasses when they start to grow in pretty pretty dense, but um, we'll, I mean, we'll, we'll get to, you know, working working through those situations uh, when, when we do move into the field there. But just an idea is to... Uh, what's, what's currently going on and what, what, what has taken place in order to, to reach uh, some of these new radiation uh, capabilities. 
<coughs> so here's some results. Uh, if you if you recall, I can just uh, go back and forth. So uh, of the objects that were in the box that were planted in the box, this is a top-down view. So uh, each of the numbers represents you know the objects that are that are planted in there. Now what's to note is we see these as circles. This isn't the true uh, response of, of what uh, what is in the ground. This is the way the antenna collects the data. The antenna collects the data as hyperbola. So what you end up seeing is in the data is more like uh, this hyperbola shape. But looking top down on it, they look like circles, right? So uh, once you start filling in in all the data, they 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 start to look like circles. There's a lot of uh, processing that goes on to turn those into what the shape actually looks like, uh, which goes into the software that we're, that we're designing to actually do that. Uh, but this is just for uh, visual representation. So you can see, oh, look, it is able to see at least you know, spot you know, some of those, those tubers. Um, so another off-the-shelf antenna, this is a multi-array antenna, just like the Hybrite. Uh, it, this one has, I think, 32 antennas instead of 16. So uh, this antenna is, is doing some really cool things in utility mapping. They use it to find lines and under roads, uh, water lines, uh, things like that. But uh, basically, again, the more antennas you have, the better the resolution that you're going to have, the more space that you can cover. Um, so we also tested how this antenna would work. This antenna works at 600 megahertz. At 600 megahertz, the resolution is, is much less. At 600 would be somewhere around 8 centimeter to 9 centimeter spatial resolution, so your object would have to be uh, of decent size uh, in the sense of roots. Uh, you'd have to have a pretty large root to, to see it. Uh, well, not necessarily to see it. You can see smaller roots, but to actually distinguish between different roots, right? So that's, that's the difference. The resolution's not there to distinguish between different roots. So this is the Hybrite. The, the antenna that, that we've currently been using in the field. Uh, again, the benefit of this one is the polarization. Uh, we can look in multiple directions, right? So that's that's a big that's a big point. Roots roots are omnidirectional, right? They they they're not growing just in, in straight lines, you know, north south. They they're growing in all directions. So we need to have multiple polarizations to actually visualize the directionality of the roots, right? We need to follow them in each direction that they're going, not only in specific directions. So this is some of the results for that uh, that antenna system, and that's spacing the antennas at five uh, five to ten millimeter spacing, so getting really really close in there, and you can start to see uh, more anomalies in in the ground um, that are coming up. Uh, a lot of these could be um, more of these these structures that happen in the sand. Let's say there's a little moisture in the sand, they'll start to uh, I guess coagulate, if you will, uh, and so that could be something that's going on here. But as you can see, the resolution of the object is much more, uh, it's not as fuzzy. If you remember looking at these, you can see that it, it, it has more of a, a, a fuzzy hue to it versus once you start to get these high resolution, uh, high, high frequency antennas, you start to resolve more of the object. Those hyperbolas become more distinct, right? And so, uh, the objects start to stand out much more, uh, and so that's that's the benefit of utilizing these these types of antennas. So what we've been optimizing currently uh, for the new antenna is actually the antenna spacing. So there's only one new prototype antenna within this uh, within this box. When I say one, I mean a pair. Uh, it, it being a transmitting and a receiving antenna, so you have to transmit the energy and receive the energy. So a pair equals one antenna. And so what we've been doing is, is sampling at high density, so every one centimeter, uh, taking a new scan, and then uh, over the vegetation. And the idea there is, where do we get redundancies? So no matter how well we can focus the, the energy, there's always going to be overlap in that energy because it, it's always going to radiate uh, outward, uh, right? So there's, there's always going to be some information where the, the, the energy uh, from the energy that's coming back from the side loads, if you will, of, of the signal. So uh, we need to know where we're starting to get redundancies in the data so that we don't capture that data. We're not wasting money in the sense of adding more antennas. We're not capturing data that's, that's irrelevant because we've already caught it in the previous line, right? And then knowing 
uh, knowing that that uh, capability, right? So uh, what we're doing is data destination. So basically, we throw out each other line, throw out every third line, throw out you know, and basically say what is the optimal spacing that we need in order to visualize these objects that we have buried in, in this sample. <laughs> This is the one of the most important things uh, and where that, that LiDAR sensor comes into play also. Um, if we want to get to the vegetation, we can't necessarily go over it. So how are we supposed to measure it if we can't go over it? Well, what if we scan into it? What if we scan from the side, right? That's, that's great. So can we do that, right? We don't know if we can do that. No one's done it with GPR because uh, GPR is... Normally, it's the ground-coupled machine instrument, so you can't really pick it up and, and twist it to the side and scan sideways. So, no one's really attempted this, but with the new antennas uh, that are airborne or air launched, we have the capability of, of rotating them and saying, what is what is the capacity of the, for these antennas to measure uh, at an angle? And so, as you can see here, we uh, twisted the antenna box to different angles, and these these very these very shallow angles here. Uh, versus a, a 90 degree angle basically straight up and down here. Um, so you can see this is the, the surface, this line that you, that you see going across here, this is the soil surface. Whereas you can't necessarily see that here, it's, it's really fuzzy. You can start seeing it more and more as you, as you get deeper. Um, what we're trying to prove here is that how much energy do we really need? How much of that radiation actually has to make it into the ground? in order for us to start picking out roots, right? So a benefit is that the energy uh, may be lost in, in this through the shearing uh, of, of, the, of the signal, but we can gain this information. Basically, you can, you can add that energy back in. You know how much energy is going out. If you know what the angle is, you know how much basically is shearing off. And so if you know soil properties, you can also say, what is my dissipation of energy to soil? So uh, different soil types, uh, will start to break the, the energy out into heat, right? So as I move a frequency through the soil, that, that energy is dissipated into heat, and I can't read heat anymore as a sensor. I can only read the, the frequency coming back, right? So uh, having the capacity to know what what the data looks like when we start to shear it, right? What, where is it that is, is our most optimal, right? And so it's something that soil surface that is so pronounced, right? If we can't see it at this angle, then obviously there's no way we're going to see roots. No matter how much we gain the data, if, if we can't see the soil surface itself, uh, it's going to be very difficult to see what's below the surface. So uh, another reason that I say uh, the LiDAR instrument is of use here is because if you if you look at the soil surface, right, so if I were to shear the signal off of a soil surface, but this soil surface had... Uh, Another angle to it, so uh, for instance here, this, there's, a, there's a slight angle here. So if I was looking back the other way at it, um, that shearing happens at a, at a different angle, right? So based on the soil on the soil surface. So we need to have the capacity to know what that angle is so that we know what the shearing actually is doing. And then also the, 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 or the emissivity of the, of the soil, right? So when, when the... When the signal actually goes across like this and it hits the soil surface, it doesn't continue going at an angle. When it actually hits the surface, it diffracts, uh, like you're looking into water, and the signal starts to go down again, right? So if we know what the soil surface looks like, if it's rounded like this, and the signal's coming down at it uh, perpendicular to that roundness or to, the, to an angle that's like this, then the signal is actually going straight through it. But if the soil surface is flat and it's coming at this angle, then we're actually we're actually changing uh, we're diffracting the energy and it's going in different angles. So we need to also know uh, what are these different soil um, so soil topography information, right? So it's, uh, when when we go to add things like like lidar systems or whatnot, it's not only so that we can see you know type of upground structure, but it's also so that we can uh, correct for these because if we're trying to measure roots. We need to know which direction our energy is moving so that we know what, where the root is, right? We can't just cross-section the soil and say the root is here because that's the angle that we're directing it, right? So uh, we, we need to have the ability to, to correct for that. 
Um, so here's what our prototype is going to look like. Um, it, it definitely is uh, more fuzzy, if you will, but uh, what you'll see here is uh, what's important here is this this phase function. You see how it, it's black, white, black, white, black, and so going through the phases, whereas it's, it's much more distinct in, in a specific color. So um, radar has um, multiple functions. It's not just the amount of energy that's coming back that I'm measuring. It's the, the amount of energy that's coming back at a position, right? So uh, if you can think of energy oscillating, right, so it's, it's waves just going going uh, through, through the soil. So if I'm going through the soil and um, I hit an object, that wave didn't complete necessarily, right? So that energy came back before the completion, so it came back off phase. So that information is important to us. Uh, is, so having this, this, this view versus, you know, some of the other views is, is much more uh, valuable to us, you know, because now we know the more specific object position, right? So the antenna is giving us back really clean data in that regard. Um, so here's an example of what the cross-sectional data looks like. So if I were to um, scan over this this, this uh, vegetation here and then cut uh, or fade down into the ground and, and create like a wall right here, um, this is what what that would look like, right? And so what we what we know for a fact is that the root system got down to 36 uh, inches. There is a metal plate plant, uh, planted or positioned about somewhere here and it's about uh, 18 inches down. And so that metal plate reflection is right here. Um, and we're able to measure with our new software basically the bottom of the root zone right at 36 inches. This is in nanoseconds, and so um, the, the numbers here don't really mean anything other than, than time. Um, so, but these darker objects are actually uh, rhizomes from, from this, this uh, plant. So, each one of these spots is a, is a specific rhizome coming off of the plant in that cross section, right? And then what you can see here is you see this smooth kind of contour here versus this more rough contour in, in this zone. That's basically the root, that's, that's what we're uh, interpreting as the root zone when it comes to the data analysis portion, right? Is the difference in, in, this, in this structure, so. Um, when we go into data processing in software, uh, not a demo. I'm, I'm not able to do the demo. Um, I, I thought I'd change that. Uh, anyway, so the software, one of the issues is that we have a multitude of data, and this data needs to be processed with iMathematics. Um, so we basically switched from working with CPUs to working with GPUs. Not only that, we now have the capacity to work uh, if you if you can imagine when I pulse energy, this is a pulse of energy down into the soil. I can I can modify this energy pulse by doing gains. I can do filters. I can do all kinds of things to this energy pulse. The second that I do it here, in our software is now it's now visualized here. So you can see how your your software is actually making modifications to your data and whether or not that's actually accurate. Right. So you can visualize what it is that you're doing. So when I gain something. Am I overgaining my root zones? Am I undergaining my root zones? What is actually occurring? Right. So we have the capacity to now visualize it um, in, in, in two dimensions. And then if you could imagine every scan, every line scan has its own two dimensional plane, right? So this is looking down into the into the soil. Um, so if you stack these all together, then you end up getting a three dimensional renderization of what's going on. So any modification I do on a single individual line, so this is just one pulse here, another pulse here, and so forth. Anything that I do here and I make a change, I'll see it here and in all three, for all three dimensions. Uh, so right now with the Geostat Center, we've had the ability to uh, implement a lot of the traditional uh, algorithms that are used, um, along with some new algorithms that, that we're developing here for the actual uh, processing of, of the data that, that we currently have. So. Um, here's an example of, of what uh, what we're doing. Uh, this is a simulation. Uh, this was created by a, a postdoc on the project, Ileana. Um, and the, the data was actually taken with a LIDAR system. So this is this is really a, a cassava root uh, that was that was grown in hydroponics. 
Um, and so this is the fine root path of it. And so it, this is this is a computer generated uh, three dimensional uh, rendering of an actual root zone, right? Um, and so what we ended up doing is utilizing a software package called GPR Max. Uh, you have the capability to simulate what the signal is actually doing uh, in the soil, right? So it, I emit an energy, and I can see that energy moving through this box, if you will, and how it interacts with the roots and what, what comes back. So what ends up coming back are these two-dimensional images, this raw image. So this is what it actually looks like. This is what the GPR gives us, all right? And so what we end up seeing here, this is a migrated version. So like I said, you have these hyperbolas. Those hyperbolas aren't necessarily the outer edges of the object, but if you can imagine, if I pull the signal from this position and my object is, is over here, right, I'm X distance away from that object. If I move my antenna closer, that object just got closer to me. So if you could, you could think that the hyperbola is starting here, I'm far from the object, I'm getting closer to the object, now I'm moving away from the object, right? So you, you're actually measuring your distance from the object as you, as you move you know, towards it and away from it. So we have to migrate that information to where we force that energy uh, to move towards the apex, where that object really is. And so that's what's occurring here, is we take this raw data, we move these energy packets that are out here on the edge towards the apex and say, this is, this is really where my object is. And so this is, this is a uh, migrated version of this root zone. So now you can start to really uh, delineate that, that root. And then these are just new uh, algorithms that, that we're developing uh, which this one is, is actually the coolest and, and so far the most evident in determining root depth. Um, so you can see here that this algorithm has the capacity to say uh, this this area is definitely different than this area, and therefore my root zone ends here, and it actually you know matches with the root zone depth. So uh, we, we have that ability to see that now with the, the current algorithm. Uh, this is being tested. We, we can't say that this is 100% um, true just yet. We're creating more of these models so that we can simulate uh, and create more of these, and then we can come back and end up with, with uh, a way of testing as whether or not that factor is. And so um, arrow here being the, the bottom of the root zone, arrow here being more of a the initial angle, this, this, this rooting angle that, that you see here coming basically off the main, the main stop. So, um, that's, that's what these arrows are, are illustrating here. So, not only do we have some measure of depth, but we, we can get some measure of, of the initial angle. Um, so, and this gives into what, uh, some of you may have seen before in some previous data. Uh, we're working on a selection of early root bulking in cassava. Cassava being a uh, important crop to um, a majority of, of uh, small uh, smallholder farmers in Africa. Um, it's, it's actually a really big crop in Southeast Asia for the starch companies, um, and so basically, its its yield is is its root, right? So it creates these massive roots. Um, and what we're doing is saying, can we actually measure these roots and uh, when they're coming in, when they're bulking, and, and how many are there, that, that kind of thing. Um, so we're working with CIOT, IITA, and um, just to a degree with, with some potatoes, um, and IITA with some yams. Um, so here's an example, basically, of the, of the raw data, and then uh, this is the filtered data, so basically getting rid of a lot of the noise. Um, in, in the data, and so you can start to see these hyperbolas a little more clear, and that's because this is cassava, this is a much larger object, it's easier for me to see an object that's way up there, because that object is, you know, has a diameter of, let's say, something like 8 centimeters, 10 centimeters. Um, so, these hyperbolas are much more clear, and you can start to visualize those roots much better, so when I migrate that data, I can actually see more specific cross-sections of, of those roots, right? So, um, this this is five individual plants, one here, two, three, four, and then five over here kind of cut off. Um, and so this is this is the migrated version of it. And so a lot of these specs that you see here 
our, our root positions. And as over transform is basically saying, uh, going back to that oscillation of the wave, the wave is, is a continuous oscillation, right? But so you have both positive and negative returns in the wave, right? So we want to get rid of those negative returns and just visualize the easy part, which just visualize it as all positive sections. So that's what you end up seeing here. And so these dark regions are those positive return uh, objects in the ground that they will return there. So this is a pretty clear distinction of cross section of the root. <clears throat> and so what we end up doing with that is saying, um, it, it's a it's a very simple procedure. It was actually started uh, in the forestry industry. Um, uh, the U.S. Department of uh, the Forest Service, uh, yeah, U.S. Forest Service, um, basically designed this this uh, approach where uh, a very similar processing uh, protocol here. It, uh, there was some adjustments that I made for cassava, but anyway, the idea is that. Any of these dark responses could be classified as a root, so we need to know um, what those dark responses are. So in, in this scenario, um, when we were in the field, we also measured uh, root positions uh, based on, on photographs and, and laying out state measures. Um, so we know that, that the root is at that position. Therefore, at that position, uh, that, that's the color that I'm looking for because I know it's the root. So. Um, it's, it's basically, if, if you are this color, then you are classified as a 1, which is root. If you are not, you're classified as a 0, throw everything out. So now what I do is I just count all my 1s, right? So however many amount of 1s that I have in this image, then I know what my, my fresh weight for that root in the field was. So then it's, it's total number of 1s, of pixel 1s, is equal to total fresh weight in, in the field, right? So what we ended up doing was total number of ones, if you will, and then uh, our wet weight. And then this is utilizing all varieties. Uh, we utilized three varieties in, in this trial. And uh, we were able to regress, uh, linearly regress the, the information to find uh, an actual R squared uh, overall of 0.63. That's utilizing each. Um, what's to note here is that uh, that's good in the, in the sense of roots. Uh, we haven't had the, the ability to, to measure roots before. We now have some some uh, ability to do that. But what's important here is that this variety and this variety were planted in a soil type that was more sandy. So um, we're actually able to visualize those roots a lot better, whereas this was in a more clayey soil, and the energy is dissipated a lot faster into heat. And so we lose, uh, so our R square here is 0.51, um, whereas in the sandy soil it's 0.77 or 0.63. So in the overall, um, we, we draw down um, our R square because of these, these outliers, if you will, but it's really the, the soil type, not necessarily an outlier. So what's to note, or what we can gain from this is utilizing those, that regress information we could then go back and say, okay, uh, let's compare that um, in the sense of across time. So if my stuff was three months, four months, five months, or six months, uh, the darker color is the true weight. Um, the predicted weight, utilizing the general model, so that's utilizing this model here. And then um, the predicted weight using the genotype-specific model, right? So that's using um, its, its specific model uh, that goes here, right? So... What we ended up seeing is that early on, we're overestimating, right, these, these root weights. Um, one reason for that is the roots are a lot smaller, they're a lot finer, right? So what's to say that we're actually measuring the root and not necessarily a clay cod in, in the soil? It's not giving us back that same reflection, that same intensity, right? There's, there's, there's uh, issues with that. Whereas when you get to these larger root objects, um, the, it's, it's, a little more standardized um, in that the, the objects are bigger. You no longer have that that issue with with these, these smaller objects could potentially be classified as that. It's they're very distinct. I know I know that object is there. It's, it's, it's very large. Um, so we we can end up we can start to see these trends. Uh, so um, even even though it's I mean these are significantly different, but once you get close, they're they're, they're more accurate. But then. What, what's noted here is this trend, this growth trend, right, that's occurring. And so 
when it comes to early early root bulking, um, we we want to know this is is when is the cassava ready to actually harvest? When can you get it out of the ground? Right? We don't want it there that long. We we want you know the farmer to have maybe two crops in there or um, basically create more more uh, more production there for them. Um, have have the ability to rotate something else in instead of having it a crop that's a, a normally a 12 month crop, right? So we end up seeing these growth these growth curves uh, being created. Um, and here's an example of of another um, another variety, and so you can see here the difference is that um, here it clearly separates uh, between the two, um, whereas here um, this variety starts to actually bulk around five months, but it's not stable, right? It, 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 it's bulking, but it's not bulking uh, completely for all of, all of the, all of the plants, right? So you end up getting this, this greater uh, variability within the variety, right? Um, whereas here, it's, it's a little more stable. They're, they're, they're more, uh, I should point it out here, it, it, it starts to stay, it starts to normalize. It starts to, to, to shrink, uh, Basically, the variability between them is less. So anyway, um, going back into what we're doing, um, in, in roots and tubers now, we, we've progressed. We've started to look at all roots and tubers. Uh, we've taken advantage of our, uh, our partners, if you will, at CIOT um, and IITA, who has yams, um, and cassava, and then SIP, who has different, uh, different potatoes. Um, and so um, in October, we'll be gone for the rest of the year um, to these, these locations, utilizing the new uh, optimized radar uh, from IDS to, to measure uh, a lot of these, a lot of uh, these new roots and supers. And so um, this is just an example of, of the, some troughs that we built here in College Station um, so that we can start testing this, this new antenna by planting in. Uh, roots and tubers, uh, different vegetation types, and then seeing its response with a sense of different uh, soil gradients. So anyway, it's just a, an overview of what's been going on in uh, Dr. Hayes' group, um, some of the advancements that we've made, the people that we've been working with, and, and the reason that uh, it, it's not, I, I shouldn't say, we have we have plenty of data, but it, it's, it's, um, how you go about analyzing that data that's important. You can't just um, give it, you know, one 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 pass and say this is it. That's 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 fine. That that's going to work. Let's let's optimize this. Let's look for the best way. Let's look for the 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 most efficient way at, at analyzing this information. So whether it's, it's developing a new uh, antenna system or developing a whole new software platform to to process this information. Um, that's, that's what we're trying to do here. So um, with that, thank you, and if, if, uh, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer. <laughs> yes. So you mentioned that there are some soils that are uh, system is not working right. Mm -hmm. Do you have an idea of why? Right. So normally it's because of the clay content in the soil. The um, the way clay is it's structured, it's sheeted. Well, I mean, it depends on this. And then it's also the, the what's the, the term? The, the, the electrical capacity of, of, the, of the soil itself, right, to, to move that energy. So the biggest issue is that when I'm trying to push energy through the soil, um, either I'm, I'm holding on to that energy that's moving, which the, the clay may be doing, or my sheeting is so... Uh, it's stacked so tight that it's, it's forcing that frequency, that, that wave, to push through that sheeting, and so it dissipates that energy into heat. And the antenna, from the standpoint, like I said, an antenna being a pair of transmitting and receive, that receiving antenna can't record the, the heat that's being sent back. It can only record the frequency information that's being sent back, right? So the, that, that's the issue with, with the different soil types. It's, it's usually just clay or water content because it's, it's holding the energy or just dissipating the energy to heat. Yes? Right, so um, one of the reasons why we're also collecting ancillary data, um, if, we can, if we can start to map moisture in the field, then we can also say what, um, what are the issues that we're going to have, how deep are we able to look in that soil, 
uh, maybe we just need to come back another day. Uh, but it, it gives us the ability to say, okay, this is at least we know to a degree what what the, what the moisture uh, level is and um, basically what the theoretical uh, depth of, that the energy would actually be able to get to in, in those scenarios. So that's one of the reasons why we're collecting a lot of the ancillary data also. Yes. Uh, is there in some simple cross Identity planting is being done in good condition. So, can we use GPR there also? Um, I guess that it would be what is what is your use of the GPR in those conditions? So, if if it was to measure like root architectures, things like that, it depends on on that high density and how those roots are interacting with each other. Is there enough separation for me to say that this is one plant and this is another plant? If there's not then I may not be able to say the difference when I'm looking at two plants side by side like this, but if I turn, I can then start to say something in, in their sense of going out into the, into the rows between them. So it, it's just dependent on, on what it is you're trying to accomplish within that high density planting. But, it, I mean, the tool can, can get through most things, especially the new one it being air launched, um, but, it, I mean, it, it's just dependent on what you're trying to look for. Yeah, because uh, I was concerned that uh, you know, the roots of one genotype, the overlap with the root of other genotype Right, exactly. So that, that would be the biggest issue is, is if you want to separate the two, um, you, you may not have that, that ability to separate them because you, you can't define where one stops and one, where one starts. Right, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes? Right. So, um, my uh, my colleague, uh, like Dr. Hayes said at the beginning, uh, Sean Thompson um, had started this project, and he was working at Week actually. And um, in his data, what we ended up seeing there, it, from from my perspective, was it's an indirect measurement of the fine roots. Uh, and this was this was in a very clay soil. Um, it is when you we collected the data post harvest, and so the roots the roots that were in the soil had started to decompose, and they started to create these cavities, these air cavities. So we were measuring the air cavities, right, instead of the actual root itself, right. So it's an indirect measure of the fine roots in the sense of the the, the soil structure that it creates by now creating the, these cavities, right. Um, so that's that's one way potentially of doing it. The other is is looking at this. So these are these are fine roots that you see here. Um, it's it's just how you go about analyzing it. And so our algorithms are going about analyzing this, utilizing you know some some actually pretty novel approaches in, in how you would go about looking at, at this. So you may not be saying I, I can see a specific fine root. That's that's not what we're saying here. It's it's saying that. Fine roots are creating some kind of disturbance in, in the in the soil structure itself that you're now seeing some response from that, right? So uh, you get multiple returns to a fine roots to just figure out you have one return here and one return here. The algorithm is right now connecting a linear return, so we have to figure out how to connect <coughs> You know, we don't we don't know where the next return is, so we have to figure out how to get the data to follow the right move. So it sounds like you can, you can, you think like animals, effects, you know, some rough measurements or whatever. Right. Yeah. With, with these visual features, we'll, we'll be happy at that, but hopefully. Right. And some, some things, I, I mean, I did, I did do right uh, down in the uh -huh. um, and it was basically the same thing as what we found with Sean Thompson's data. It's, it's an indirect measurement, um, but it's not that it's not capable of it. Um, it's just how are you going about analyzing it? You have to change the approach. Whereas it, with those, we're, we're looking at the noise in the data, and in, in roots and in tubers, we're actually looking at the real data, right? So it's just how you go about looking at the data to analyze it. Yes, sir. How did you collect the cross-down and run over? Right, right. So in, in, this, in this scenario, we actually did have to cut the crop down and run over the top field because it's a ground couple position. Yeah. So obviously, that's not optimal. That's not what we want to do. But uh, we wanted to prove that the tool doesn't have the case. The, 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 the,
Right. right. So if the air launch one did ever have enough energy. So the the reason for the so here for instance, the reason for the air launch uh angular position is that if we can run in this in this row, for instance, yeah. and then project the energy if you will, like this, yeah. right? Then I can move through there in between and then I can start to there's there's more than enough power in this new antenna. It focuses the energy really well that I have I have the ability to to, to measure in that direction. Yeah. So, you ever direct the antenna to your leg or anything? Uh, <laughs> yes, but it it wasn't pulsing, so it's it. Um, it Is it a trick here? <laughs> no, it, I mean if, if you if you left it long enough, yes, it doesn't have enough power to, so to really your lunch with it. Though. I guess if you passed it over enough time, too, yeah, but, it, yeah, yeah, it, it's just, it's, it's the amount of time with these antennas, it's not necessarily the amount of power. There, there, there are some, these, these are all regulated, FCC regulated. If we were not to have FCC regulation, I can guarantee you we can, we can map out a lot of cool things in the ground, uh, because we have enough energy to actually get there and come back, but we fry ourselves at the same time, so. Um, it's not necessarily something we want to do. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I think I, I had it, I had it last year somewhere. Mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. but if the one thing missing is the, for me, you don't have a get to the, the, the formality, the mathematics involved in your, in your process. Right. For example, for example, how do you, how do you correct for, um, absorptivity? Let me put it that different cells, different materials will have different absorptivity. That is one. Secondly, you're talking about diffraction. Mm -hmm. your, your instrument, what is the, what is the default diffraction? Is it the same thing? Does your instrument assume that your soil is spherical or flat or circular? Right? Those are things that one would like to know. So, right. so one, one would have an idea of what you're correct. Right. So it's not, um, I don't know how to. So to, to your second question to this one on first is if if I'm moving my system through the field at this angle, right, and, and we go we talk about diffraction, the system doesn't know what the soil surface is doing at all. That's, that's not the case for the system. Uh, but it's, it's just sending the energy out, right? At this interface, depending on permittivity of the soil, um, it, it's going to change how it actually... This angle is, is not known unless you know this parameter, right? So it, there's no one true answer for this angle of depression, right? That's dependent on, on this soil parameter, right? So this goes back to the ancillary data that we collect, right? If we know the soil uh, properties beforehand, then we can say what this angle will be, you know, through that section, right? Mm -hmm. You can never sample soil, you know, this, so this is my surface. I can't sample every single spot, but I can, I can generalize, right? I can sample here and then spatial autocorrelation. I can, I can sample here and then interpolate between the two, that kind of thing. But I can, I can say what my diffraction angle would be, you know, for this position, uh, and this position, as well as, you know, this position. It should be, it, it, if it's an interpolation, it should be, you know, half of it. But it's dependent on, on this value, what, what that value of the soil is. So, um, from the standpoint of, of the mathematics of it, uh, which was the first question, um, I, I, I mean, there's, there's a lot of mathematics to it in how, which, what are you looking for specifically? Stuff like, um, absorptivity. Mm -hmm. like, like, how do you, okay. Right, so there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of theoretical, uh, papers that are already done on, on how that, the absorption properties are of, of different media, of different soil types. And then there's also a lot of papers that are empirical studies saying, you know, how those soil types would actually affect it in the real world, 
right? So there's the theoretical and the empirical, and we're basically taking from what we find in literature to adjust for that. So it's, it's just, I, I often don't put it in anything because it's not something that, you know, the, direct, the audience directly, directly would want to hear, right? It's, 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 it's the mathematics side. Right. But, but it's, it's all made into the software. Right. right. It, it, it's, we find it in, in literature, like Ilyana was saying, we, we, we see that in there, and then that, that's how we go about adjusting for it. But there's, there's tons of papers to have done it empirically um, to say what, what the response is to the solar property. All right. Any other Thank you. Thank you.